Hello and welcome to another chat about uh, a topic in military history. I'm Justin and joining me here today is Joe Fonseca. Uh, Joe is a PhD candidate at the University of Calgary and is currently studying the Boxer Uprising. I thought it would be interesting to drag him onto YouTube to talk about it and thankfully for all of you and me, uh, he agreed to do so. So welcome, Joe. Hi, it's good to be here. So this first video will be a brief introduction to the Boxer Uprising for those um, that may not know much more about it beyond that it happened, um, which is also me, uh, because my only exposure to the Boxer Uprising was from university lectures that I had uh, over eight years ago now, um, ironically from Joe's supervisor. Okay, so let's kick things off. Who were the Boxers and what was the Boxer Uprising about? So this is, again, the big question, which I think we could talk about for hours, but we'll do a nice, simple um, overview today. Eh? So the Boxers are a popular uprising that arose out of secret societies in northern China, whose express purpose was to remove foreign interference in China and try and protect what they saw as the traditional status quo. It's hard to categorize who the Boxers were, but simply it's whoever decided at around the turn of the 20th century that they had enough with foreign intervention, um, imperialism, and what they saw as um, the ravages of Christianity in Northern China, and decided as a group or individually to join up together to expel foreigners and expel those who they saw as falling to uh, the foreign yoke. I mean, those who converted to Christianity, really. Okay. Um, and is there are there any estimates for how many boxers however defined there were at various points in the uprising? Uh, that's difficult, but there's definitely thousands, um, probably into the tens of thousands. But um, the their kind of core in uh, Shandong, like south of Beijing area, is just one area where we see them. We also see them in Shanxi, we see them in Inner Mongolia, up in Manchuria, and also see people who may not actually be boxers, but who are launching their own anti-government uprisings, their own anti-foreign attacks, who are aligning themselves with boxers, but may not actually be practicing the traditions of the secret society that boxers are. So numbers are difficult because we don't really have a structure and people were coming and going as they saw fit, but it was enough to totally destabilize the region. Oh, okay. When exactly did the Boxer Uprising take place? And is there, are there any difficulties with periodization? Yeah, that's actually really interesting. I, I like that because there's a lot of issues with periodization, especially when you talk about what is a Boxer. So, you know, we say they're uh, the, the mass movement that rose out of these secret societies. Well, these secret societies are often hundreds of years old. And there's, you know, some oral history and traditions and some even some missionary records from the 1700s of people who uh practice this martial art practice this spiritual um traditional chinese movements and who were you know at least nominally anti-foreign but the actual you know uprising it, it's hard to tell when when that separated from those other uh movements right when you have people who just practiced boxerism as a and okay and i gotta say this because Boxer is the foreign way to explain these people. These people who practice okay. martial arts um, for self-defense and for community um, and often as a protection against bandits. But when the people who are writing these histories that were reading, the, the missionaries and the foreigners are seeing them, they call them boxers or Chinese boxers because they're, you know, they're practicing martial arts. They're not using weapons. But trying to pinpoint the, the the day that, okay, here's where the boxers showed up, here's where the boxers became a thing, is difficult because of how fluid that um, history of secret societies is and how, of course, tight-lipped it can be. There's not too many written records from the point of view of the boxers. Mm, I can imagine, yeah. The, the general accepted, like, here's when the boxer uprising that we're talking about today happened, is 1898, when it became clear that groups who were calling themselves boxers or righteous harmonious fist or the the plum uh the plum boxers and a lot of the other little names are actually actively moving against chinese christians um and churches in the countryside either attacking them or trying to force them out um you know using their words and all that that's 1898 okay uh when does it kind of conclude roughly speaking 
Uh, again, I think the the easy answer is to say September 1901, because that's when mm-hmm. the Boxer Protocol was signed. When the after the war was finished, after the Europeans were in Beijing and they were uh, trying to talk to the Qing government about how to go forward, that that's a good, easy, clean stop date. But that's okay. of course not entirely accurate because even after that, you have some fairly violent, punitive movements where European contingents were moving into the countryside to you know root out boxers. But that basically boils down to attacking villages that were boxer aligned or the boxes were using and slaughtering civilians often, unfortunately. Uh, okay. And in the north, in Manchuria, uh, the Russians were fighting boxers and boxer aligned militias into like 1904, even. It, oh, wow. It, it lasts quite a while. Hmm. Um, so I guess this is this will be a big one that we'll have to do way more detail on. In a, in a future video, but can you provide a really quick summary of kind of the the main part of the Boxer Uprising from beginning to end? And are, are there any like ways that you can break the uprising into distinct phases that you think would be helpful for uh, understanding? It's something I struggle with, but the easiest way to break up the Boxer Uprising is looking at it from the foreign military perspective. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, that's how we have most of the, the sources and that makes it easiest to uh, do further reading if someone wants to. So really, from the outside looking in, it's easiest to look in at uh, 1898 when the boxer starts uh, becoming visible, right? Um, before then, the people were doing their, their martial arts, and that's fine. It was just something that people noticed. But 1898, you actually see bands of people who identify as boxers uh, moving out to attack Chinese Christians, or uh, missionaries who are attending to Chinese Christians. And that's like the first real phase. That lasts about a year where Europeans are reporting to the outside world and say, hey, this, this is a, a real movement. This is a real thing that the, these boxers are, are fighting. And it's this kind of interesting curiosity of these these crazy Chinese who were using mysticism and, and martial arts to, to fight against the Europeans, but no one really gives it any real heed. Um, it's not until... 1900 if we're jumping right ahead to um the spring summer of 1900 where the boxers have become such a force that the Qing government doesn't want to and feels it might not be able to contain them and yeah. boxers are moving more aggressively into major population centers so beijing which has a sizable european population there the the foreign legations and the merchants and some of the marines that are stationed there are seeing these uh, you know, brightly clad boxers uh, waving their banners uh, running through Beijing, and they start to get worried. So I like to start when I talk about this with May 30th, uh, 1900, because that's kind of a firm date when the Europeans in Beijing are recognizing that, okay, this is becoming a problem, and I don't think the Qing are going to take care of it. So on the 30th, you have Allied Marines from the coast moving into Beijing. And while this gives the Europeans their bit of sense of security, because we have, you know, there's guys with guns here to protect us now, it also starts to inflame the boxers a bit, because this is a, a, you know, a very visual show of imperialist power, right? This is not their country, but they're bringing soldiers in from the coast to occupy parts of Beijing, you know, in their eyes. So the boxer attacks get more brazen. Uh, It's the 31st, like the next day that... um, Sir Claude MacDonald, the British uh, minister in Beijing, tries to get all the civilians to come to the British legation, tries to get everyone to kind of close up shop and um, come together for safety because they don't think they can protect people anymore. Now, for about a month from then until mid-June, it's just kind of scary time when the Europeans don't know what's happening. The Qing government doesn't quite know what they're going to do with the boxers or with the Europeans. And well, again, we don't have the boxer perspective, but they are becoming a bit more brazen so i think it's on june 9th yeah june 9th is a a big day because there's a european racetrack is burned by boxers and they encounter european civilians who fight back so you have this battle you know air quotes battle in beijing between boxers and european civilians that leaves a couple boxers dead and the uh the diplomats are starting to panic that okay this is this is becoming a real thing Mm mm-hmm so then June 11th, you have the first prominent uh, foreigner in Beijing killed by a boxer. 
this Japanese Chancellor Sugiyama Akira, who's going out to meet what he thinks are more European reinforcements coming from the coast, but he's actually uh, surprised and killed by boxers on route. Oh. And that really, you know, puts the fire into the Europeans because they're, they're not, it's not just uh, brawls outside of a, um, a racetrack anymore. This is a prominent official actually murdered. Mm-hmm. And that starts panicking. So it's around there that um, Admiral Seymour, who's a British admiral who's uh, on the coast with the, the, the navies, because the Europeans have uh, squadrons of ships off the coast of Beijing because they're, they're not quite sure what's going on. And he sets off to relieve them with a, a force of 2,000 or so Marines. And that's like the next big chunk is a Seymour expedition that uh, oh. is supposed to go to Beijing and, and relieve everybody. But he doesn't really plan accordingly. He thinks it's going to be a train ride, actually. And <laughs> it's it's gone far, far beyond that. So he sets off with 2,000 Marines of different nations. They're just in the trains. Like they're not set up to fight, really. And like their stores are all in one train car. They're all in different train cars. There's um, some Imperial back and forth where the Americans want to be in this train car, not this train car, you know, that, that kind of thing. And they get a few kilometers out of Tianjin on the coast before they're completely cut off because the boxers in the countryside are literally ripping up the railroad tracks on both sides of the train. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's how, you know, you've gotten to, this is a major uprising now, right? This is mm-hmm. people's working. So, um, Seymour gets cut off and has to slowly work his way back. And we can talk all about that campaign if we do a longer one. Cause I, I think that's just an amazing part of this, but he has to do a, a slow fighting retreat back to the coast because he can't move on with only 2000 people. And, there's uh, no way he's going to be able to uh, hold his own in the countryside with no supplies. So that's that first attempt to, to rescue Beijing that fails miserably. Okay. So in Beijing, they're waiting for Seymour to show up, and he doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, Sugiyama is murdered. The relief expeditions show up. The telegraph lines are cut. And you enter this period of, like, the siege. This is the siege of Peking, the siege of Beijing that... Um, is the the famous part of this war, right? Okay. And when when and, does that start as a as a date? Um, I'd probably say the thirteenth, but they're they're pulling in June thirteenth. Mm-hmm. I think there's there's a few days between. No, you know what? Okay, here's a good day for it because <laughs> mm-hmm. everything is very um up and down and flowy, right? Nothing is saying okay. Now you guys are under siege. Here's the 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 flag. This is what's happening. Uh-huh. Right, the 20th. The 20th is the date I like. Uh-huh. So I think the, the siege of Peking starts for real on June 20th, because that's the day when Baron August von Ketteler, who's a German minister, uh, goes to or tries to go to the uh, Zhongli Yamen, the Chinese foreign... Oh, what do you want to call that? Foreign ministry. <laughs> So Baron August von Kettler goes to the uh, Zhongli Yemen, the, the Chinese foreign ministry, to discuss what's going on in Beijing, discuss the uh, the boxers and all this. And he is murdered en route by Chinese soldiers. Not boxers, but if, like actual army soldiers from the Qing. And that's when they realize that there's no way they're going to be able to um, just walk out of China, right? Or walk out of Beijing. And then what's kind of the, because I guess this is moving into the, what you could say is the final phase of of the uprising, at least as as is understood in the West, right? Yeah, it's it's tough because a lot of things are happening at the same time. So you have the, the siege is tightening in Beijing. You have Seymour who's struggling forward and then failing and having to retreat from Beijing. And then on the coast, you have the rest of the Marines and their ships who are left behind, who were thinking, okay, we've lost contact with Beijing. We know there's boxers running around the countryside. We've lost contact with Admiral Seymour. And all of our governments are, you know, weeks or months away from sending reinforcements. So what do we do? So you have these, uh, you know, three streams of the foreign experience of the boxer war, right? You have those civilians who are trapped in population centers dealing with boxers. And then suddenly the, the Qing army, you have poor Seymour, who's, you know, running back down the tracks and pulling a boat down the river because he can't use his trains anymore. And then you have the rest of the uh, Marines and soldiers on the coast who have no contact with anybody, but know that this 
uprisings happening and they don't know what to do. While Seymour is running away, while the siege is tightening around Beijing, the Marines on the coast think they have to do something. Now, this is one of the those cru- crucial moments of the campaign, of the whole uprising, the whole war, because it kind of ripples outwards from what they were doing on the coast. And I don't think anyone was really aware what they were the ramifications were going to be for what they were doing. So on the coast are a bunch of very well put together forts that look out into the Bohai Sea, like look out into the actual ocean. And these forts were Western designed, have good modern cannons and can really make it difficult for foreign navies who would be coming into the Beijing area to try and relieve civilians to make it in. But already behind the forts, are the remnants of those foreign Marines and their ships. And they decide on the 17th because they've lost contact with everybody. And they know that the boxers are running through the countryside. They decide they need to take those forts to make sure reinforcements and supplies, whenever they do show up, can come into North China. So on the 17th, the navies there actually issue an ultimatum to the Taku forts commander saying, you have to uh, evacuate and hand us over the forts or we're going to attack you. And this is, totally you know done at the local level and there's some talk with uh european governments like the the americans and the american marines don't take part because their standing orders are not to do anything aggressive only to protect civilian life but the other european the japanese all decide that we're going to do this we're going to take the taku force we're going to make sure our supply lines are secure and then figure out what the hell happened to seymour what's happening in beijing and all that right it's a very chaotic moment so they do, on the 17th, they do take the Taku forts. A um, bit of a brief, bloody battle, but the, the forts are secured by the foreigners. And they think, okay, we've secured our supply lines, we can start moving inwards. But in Beijing, the the government, the Demper- uh, Dowager Empress, her, her court, are seeing this and think, okay, this is a declaration of war, right? They've taken our forts on the coast from us. They have marines moving in. There's marines in inland and there's these uh, the fights happening in beijing so this is this is serious and there's a lot of back and forth in the court between those who realize this is just a big crazy problem this is a mistake this is letting the uprising get out of hand this is letting um the anger of the people spill over into politics but there are also others who think that they should use this they should use the boxer uprising this is the best chance we have to rid china of these imperialists and actually you know, regain some of that sovereignty and control that they lost. And they went out in the end, the ones who want to support the boxers and declare war on the foreigners. So this securing of the forts on the coast uh, is one of those exciting incidents for the Chinese government to actually declare war on everybody. And that's one of those crazy things that they, they declared war on everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so that, you know, in, in reality, that's eight major nations, right? That's Britain, America, um, France, Germany, Austria, Russia, and Japan. (laughs) And also Italy, I I suppose, because there's some Italians there. (laughs) So that, you know, is can be considered a a poor decision, but it's what they felt was in their best interest at the time, because the, uh, the boxers were actually, you know, doing a fair job of slowing down this, they stopped Seymour, and they've got the Europeans hold up in Beijing. But yeah, so when that happened, then the Europeans um, decided to respond in, in force. And that made sense. It took some some feet dragging because they weren't quite sure what was going on. Uh, uh, Claude McDonald in Beijing, as much as I love him, he was very slow to uh, figure out the depth of the boxer problem. And then you have, you know, some international issues of prestige and empire and all these fun things that shouldn't be um, really shouldn't be taking place in this European or this foreign crisis and this massive uprising in China, but it's still, you know, forefront in everyone's minds, who's going to lead the expedition? Because that's a matter of national prestige. Uh, are the Russians okay with Japanese sending people because they're um, having spats over Manchuria? You know, the British are there, so they're going to lead, right? You know, there's, there's a lot of these kind of questions that are ridiculous in hindsight, but were very important at the time. Mm-hmm. But yeah, the, like a, yeah, how does this how does this wrap up? Yeah, the I'm long, assuming poorly for the Chinese. <laughs> it, it's it's tough. So the the forces do arrive. You know, the Marines get their reinforcements trickling in. You know, tens of thousands from China from Japan 
uh, thousands from Russia and everyone else kind of scrambles from India, from American sent troops from the Philippines over. And they do take Tianjin with great difficulty. And then they do push from Tianjin up the coast to Beijing and relieve it. But not out, not until after, I think it was 55 days of lockdown siege for the, the Europeans there. Hmm. And for most of that campaign, the, the Qing are fighting alongside the boxers to, you know, oppose the Europeans and, and the Japanese. But after the foreigners reach Beijing and take Beijing, forcing the, uh, the government to flee, they throw the boxers to the wind, right? They were oh, yeah. the useful tool. There were, you know, many thought a useful tool. Many <laughs> were still panicking about them. But that was the moment where the boxes were on their own and the Europeans setting up their, um, you know, little interim government in Beijing were sending out contingents to go slaughter people all up and down the countryside who they thought were boxers who, who worked with the boxers. So that's the, the long and short of it. It was a bloody campaign with a lot going on at the same time. But in the end, the combined powers of eight nations acting pretty quickly were able to unhorse the, uh, the boxers and their, the Qing army allies. Mm-hmm. Okay. So why, why, um, why does the, the boxer uprising, I guess, matter? Uh, like, well, how did it impact uh, various participants? So this is something that I'm, I'm advocating for because a lot of people don't think it's that important or they, mm-hmm. they kind of relegate it to a, a smaller portion or a smaller issue in the region compared to say, the Russo-Japanese War 1904-1905 or even the Sino-Japanese War 1894-95 where you see these massive sea changes in how the political landscape in East Asia is is operating. But I think the Boxer Uprising is just as important as those conflicts because not only do you see um, this, is, this is China's last major traditionalist response to imperialism. There are times... Uh before this where there was some inkling towards um modernization in the sense that they want to bring in western technology to help china grow and modernize like what japan did you know they, they would look at japan seeing they did this successfully in the 1870s and 80s and say we need to do this as well but that always met with a very strong entrenched anti-modernist um the gentry basically didn't want this to happen. A lot of people were invested in a traditional China, the traditional Chinese structures. After the Boxer Uprising, this is that's the last gasp. That's the last hurrah for a traditional response to Western imperialism. After that, it all the accounts you can find, it, it's like miraculous to them. These Europeans are, are suddenly thinking, "Oh wow, look at these Chinese! Now they're they're uh, they're embracing our technology. They're doing this 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 sea change." That after the Boxer Uprising, they're done. They're tired. We can't keep doing this the, the traditional way. And all across up and down China, you see um, embracing modern manufacturing and you see the, the, the rise of Western learning um, at a scale, like there was always Western learning in the 19th century, but at a scale that is much more in line with what Japan was doing. Okay. Yeah. So this, for China, this is a major moment and one that can't be ignored. Like the, the political activists in 1911 and the, the the fall of the Qing dynasty and the fall of dynasties in China uh, altogether, you know, they can, you can look back to the Boxer Uprising and see this as being one of those key moments in defining how those politics grow. Now, for the other, the, the eight nations that were arrayed against the Chinese, there's a, you know, different types of responses. The, the major one, I think the most important one is Russia and Japan. They both are, you know, warily looking at each other over this conflict. And Russia took this as an excuse to put a lot of men in Manchuria, which is the disputed area between Japan and and Russia, right? Uh, Northeastern China is Manchuria, just above Korea. And they want, they both want to control that. Russia uses proximity and the boxers as an excuse to occupy that area. And that's going to be one of the major inciting incidents for the Russo-Japanese war in four years time. Okay. So I think those are the major ones. We can also talk about the uh, British and the Americans and how they're dealing with uh, China as a, a growing state. You know, America gave its money or invested its money from the Boxer Protocol back into China and education. But I think those are the key ones. You have Chinese uh, finally wholesale adopting modernization as the way forward. And you see the groundwork for the Russo-Japanese war being set. So I guess we'll, we'll stop here for now.
And thank you very much, Joe. This has been really interesting, actually, uh, trying to summarize a very complicated set of events in a very short amount of time. <laughs> Thanks very much, and I appreciate your uh, dealing with my rambling. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Um, so you can find Joe on Twitter, um, at Joe Fonseca Hist, um, and we'll probably put it up on screen. Mm. Um, and he talks a lot about history, and he also writes um, articles about war games and such. So if you're into war gaming, um, you'll probably find him quite interesting as well. Uh, we hope this has been uh, an enlightening introduction to the Boxer Uprising. And then for the hardcore among you, uh, we'll, we will be recording a long-form chat on the Bo Boxer Uprising that will be coming very soon. Um, I guess you could call it Joe Unleashed. Um, <laughs> or we'll just let Joe talk about battles and, and all of these very interesting events um, for oh, those that are interested. <laughs> love talk about every engagement of the whole Boxer War if you want to. <laughs> we'll be here for eight hours. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, so I guess with that, um, have a nice day. We'll see you next time. Thanks again.